Let us stand now to hear our King calling us, inviting us into his presence for worship. Clap your hands, all peoples, and shout to God with the voice of joy. For Yahweh Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. And so, a God who has called us, now let us respond and thank him. And also ask him that he would continue to bless us. Gladden the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in covenant love to all who call upon you. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Our God, a great King, calls us in order that he would give to us his blessing. Beloved, to you, loved by God and called to be saints, the conquerors who overcome the world and darkness and shall inherit the crown of life, grace and peace in the election of the Father by the blood of the Son and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us affirm that the God we worship is the God revealed as Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, and this theology is summarized for us in the Creed of the Church, the Apostles' Creed. Let's profess our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us respond then by singing, You righteous in the Lord rejoice. Here we affirm our great call as the ones God has loved and declared righteous that we can worship him. This is after Psalm 32 where we have said we're blessed not because we're good but because the record of our transgressions is blotted away. And we believe this God who has forgiven us our sins rules over all the earth and we desire the whole world should come and praise him. So Psalm 33, this is verses 1 through 12, titled, You Righteous and the Lord Rejoice. You righteous and the Lord rejoice, it well becomes the good man's voice to sing Jehovah's praise. With harp of him and gladness sing, your gift of sweetest music bring to him a new song raise. For upright is Jehovah's word and all the doings of the Lord in faithfulness are wrought. In justice and in judgment right the Lord does ever take delight with goodness earth is fraught. Jehovah's word the hands has made, and all the host of them arrayed, his breath has caused to be. He rolls the waters heap on heap, he stores away the mighty deep in garners of the sea. Let all the earth Jehovah fear, let all that dwell both far and near, in awe before him stand. For lo, he spoke and it was done, and all with sovereign power begun, stood fast. 
just at his command. He makes the nation's councils vain, the plans the peoples would maintain are thwarted by his hand. Jehovah's counsel stands secure, his purposes of heart endure, forevermore they stand. Oh, truly is the nation blessed, whose God before the world confessed, Jehovah is alone. And blessed are the people are whom he has made his heritage to be and chosen for his own. Please be seated. Well, Psalm 32, as I said, is a psalm we often sing for confession saying it is wondrous and blessed is the man whose transgressions the Lord has covered over. And so here you see in Psalm 33, how blessed are those whom the Lord has chosen to be his own because he has forgiven us our sins and he has become our God. So now as we turn to the law, we're going to look at the first commandment and understand what it means to affirm that God alone is our God. It's not just an intellectual appraisal of materialism and atheism versus, you know, theism. It is rather a declaration, this God revealed in the scriptures is my God and the only true God. So let us again remind ourselves of the use and purpose of the word of God, particularly his law and how we are to live. God's law displays his holiness and perfection. It is given as my only sure guide to knowing his will and pleasing him. But as a fallen man, I cannot obey the law. I turn to the law to see my sinfulness, that I may be humbled and confess my sins before God, because he declares, as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked man turn from his way and live. I will not be justified by the works of the law. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So what does the Lord require in the first commandment? That I, not wanting to endanger my own salvation, avoid and shun all idolatry, sorcery, superstitious rites, and prayer to saints or to other creatures. That I rightly know the only true God, trust in him alone and look to God for every good thing humbly and patiently, and love, fear, and honor him with my whole heart. In short, that I renounce all created things rather than go against God's will in any way. What is idolatry? Idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts in place of or alongside of the only true God who has revealed himself in his word. So what is very important here is that we recognize that we're not, again, having an intellectual debate. Is it atheism or theism? And we're saying, no, we're theists and we're monotheists. That is obviously necessary. Beyond that, we're saying the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the only true God. And this God who is holy and perfect has also chosen to love me when I sinned against him when I violated his law, and when I actually not just denied him, but I actually believed him to be my enemy that I had to steal from, I had to take his glory from myself, he comes and he says, do you not understand? Look to the cross to see how much I loved you. I took on your flesh so that I could pay for your sins so that you would be forgiven. And now the first commandment says, believe that this is the only God. And knowing he is, and that he is so gracious, be humble and patient. You don't understand the wisdom he has and the plans he has for you, so you need to humbly and patiently endure trials that are in your life. And throughout all this time, you still love, fear, and honor God, because he is your God, your loving Father. And he says, I will do you every good 
you can know that because I'm not looking at you in your sins, but through Christ my son. In that light, then, let us go before God and confess we did commit the sin of idolatry. We did have superstitious fears, but now his spirit is working in us and we are resting and trusting in the one true God alone. Let's confess. God has sent his son Jesus in the likeness of my sinful flesh as an offering for my sin. In doing this, God demonstrates his electing love for me in that Christ died for me, the sinner, that no one is justified by the law before God is clear, for the man who by faith is righteous shall live. I don't have a righteousness that is my own from my obedience to the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I believe that I am justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from my own works and attempts to keep the law. What is this true faith that unites us to Christ? True faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as true all that God has revealed to us in his word. It is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel that God has freely granted not only to others, but to me also, forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These gifts are purely of grace, only because of Christ's merits. And so let's go before God and confess that we are indeed a people who were anxious, had little faith, doubted him and his love for us, sought other ways of obtaining good, and now he comes and he says, my little ones, Come back to me and receive, obtain every good thing. And so let us confess our sins and receive not just forgiveness, but the blessings of everlasting life. We are gathered here this day, O oh God, by your will. You have drawn us here this day in order that we would hear this word that we would affirm that you are a good God and a nation is blessed that has you as their God. And we know it is this kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ of which this church is an embassy that you speak of. But we also know that we are not natural citizens of this kingdom, but we are citizens by grace whom you purchased. And so we come before you now to confess that though you alone are God, we have sought to overthrow you. We would rather be God. We would rather decide what is good or evil, what is acceptable and not acceptable. And certainly, we want to judge our enemies in our time. And boy, we have a lot of enemies who we dislike. And yet you called us here this day to announce that you alone are king and judge, and you are to be recognized and worshipped. But you will not call us here today to crush us, but rather to reveal that the king of kings has taken on our flesh and died in our place in order that our debt would be paid so that we would be adopted and able to call the God of heaven our Father. And so we pray that as we are brought here this day, we would truly understand the depth of our sins and how wondrous is your grace, that we would recognize the instrument of faith is not a good work that we do, but rather it is that instrument, the open hand, that receives the gift of grace that you give. And so let us be thankful that you are a merciful and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in forgiving love to those with whom you have covenanted. May we therefore be thankful for the blessings which are ours in Christ and now worship you in spirit and in truth, because by your spirit you have made us now to love you, the only true God, with our heart, soul, and mind. And may we truly be thankful for the grace which is ours in Christ. Amen. Amen. Beloved, let's take things out of order. Let us stand and sing Psalm 53 to recognize the grave foolishness of denying that there is a true God. And then we will hear the declaration of pardon. Understand that Psalm 53 that we are going to sing here follows Psalm 51 where David confessed his sinfulness. Psalm 52, the pride of the one who hated God and killed his priest Doeg. And now we are seeing this is what foolishness is. Either we are wise enough to know our condition and confess our sins, or we are God deniers and therefore a curse. So let us stand and sing Psalm 53, the fool speaks in his heart.
The fool speaks in his heart. He says there is no God. Corrupt are they, their deeds are vile. Not one does any good. The Lord looks down from heaven and views the human race to see if any understand, if any seek God's face. They all have turned aside, corrupt they have become. Not one of them does any good, no, not a single one. Will sinners never learn? My people they devour. They eat my people as their bread and never seek the Lord. Great terror on them falls and they are much dismayed. Before there is a single cause for them to be afraid. The bones of all your foes you scatter all abroad. And you will put them all to shame who are despised by God. May help from Zion come, the Lord is captives bring. Let Jacob's tribes restored be glad, for joy let Israel sing. Well, beloved, if you have affirmed the one true God and not joined with the fools who have rejected these things, then there is great news for you today. Beloved, to you who by faith have confessed and repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' merit alone, I declare in the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, your sins are forgiven. The record of your transgressions is blotted away and your everlasting salvation is hid now in Christ Jesus, who will resurrect you in the last day. It is our great joyful confidence by which we are able to confess the one true God, not just as creator, but as our redeemer. So beloved, this is the good news of the gospel for you this day. You may be seated. And now we go before our God that we should bring before him our prayers, not only for our own congregation, but for the mission of the church around the world. Today also we get to thank God that Demas has joined us and also uh, as we have a large contingent of those of the Armenian race here, this is the day in which they commemorate the genocide against their race and this is the time also to bring that prayer of the nation before God. Let's pray. Our God, you are the King, almighty, holy and perfect in every way. You rule over heaven and earth and yet we have joined the enemy, the serpent, and we have foolishly rebelled against you, rejecting the obvious testimony of creation that you are an all-powerful God, that you do all things and do it very well, and yet we foolishly have sought to throw you off your throne, to usurp your right to rule. We have decided we will say what is good and evil in your sight, and though we should be destroyed, you instead, from the very beginning of man's rebellion, revealed the seed of the woman would destroy your enemy at a great cost to himself. And though then we might have under, not have understood, now we know the cost was so that we would be saved. And now we come before you, not just praising you as the creator, but as a loving redeemer who adopts us, former enemies, and makes us your children and heirs. And you give to us knowledge. You reveal to us yourself, your heart, that we would know you are a holy God who is yet gracious and merciful. And so we come before you thankful for the grace which is ours in Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would strengthen faithful churches. We thank you that you have brought us into that body that we are indeed 
a church that desires your gospel would be purely preached, that we would all mature and grow in the faith, being sanctified and doing good works, that we would desire your glory, and that our inheritance would not be the things of this earth, but rather you, that we would wait for the glory to be revealed when all things will be made new. And so we pray for the mission and ministry of this congregation, for our denomination, for all faithful confessional churches that preach the truth around the world. This day we express our gratitude. You have allowed us to meet freely and safely, and we thank you for this privilege. We thank you that though we don't do much, and yet you allow us to be part of the greater mission of the church. We thank you for the privilege of working with Ventura and the work there that a new church, a new light is present in the land. We thank you for the work in Armenia and that for years we've been able to be part of that also. And especially today, we pray for the people of Armenia that they would recognize that what makes them so distinct among their Muslim neighbors is that they worship the Lord Jesus Christ, who on the cross cried out to the Father and prayed for his enemies, forgive them. May the people of Armenia be given your spirit in order that they would believe and rather than desiring revenge would desire your glory as you bring to humble repentance the Turkic peoples who killed them and that you should grant that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ would prevail in the land. And so we pray that the blood that was spilled will not be in vain but rather the Armenian descendants would believe and would praise your name and know that the blood spilled is because the world hates you. We pray for the mission of the church around the world and we pray for Colombia, thankful that we hear that there are evangelists and missionaries among the poor and the word of the gospel goes forth. We are troubled to hear of the children that are in vicious gangs and we pray that mercy would be shown to them and that they would repent of the sins they have committed. We pray for the Comoros and Lord, we know that the Christians are persecuted by the majority of that land who hate your name. We ask that you would show mercy even to this evil and that you would turn the hearts of people and give them a new life in Jesus Christ and that the Christian church, having persevered through the persecutions you have ordained, would now bring the light of the gospel and hope to the people of the Comoros. We pray for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, rejoicing that People turned away from paganism and animism and have professed Christ, but we do pray that it will not just be a transference of the name of Jesus to their pagan gods, but rather you will help them to understand the truth of scripture and they will worship the one true God and that the church there would be firmly established and be a church that is able to take the gospel to the many tribes and tongues and nations all around that land. We pray for the Congo also and asking that the Christians there would be strengthened in their faith, there would be depth to their knowledge and they would love you all the more and their neighbors as themselves. And we pray for the small isolated islands that are being caught up in the lies of Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness. And we ask that you would not allow the liars who bring legalism and therefore oppression and death to these people, but rather the gospel would again be heard in these lands. So we pray for the Cook, Nui, Pitcairn, and Tokelau, and ask that by your will, many would be blessed and they should rejoice in you. Lord, we thank you this day that we are no longer aliens and strangers, but your children. Help us to recognize, therefore, that you have granted us a privilege of being among the sons and daughters of the King of Kings. Let us, therefore, have zeal, search for opportunity, and do our work with great joy in uplifting one another, in encouraging one another to love and good works, knowing that our call is not simply to gather for worship, but to be your people always. And may we therefore build up the body of Christ in whatever needs she has. And so we ask that you would be glorified in the words and works of each and every one of us here as we desire more and more to be conformed to the image of Christ. All this because we have not been left in our sins, because we are no longer a curse, but we are now a new creation. We are your people. And so we come before the King of heaven and earth and know that you are now our Father. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand now for the reading of the written word of the Lord. Pages 4 and 5. Hear then from the Old Testament, Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Exodus 12, 19 through 20. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. Leviticus 21, 17 through 21. Speak to Aaron, saying, None of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may approach to offer the bread of his God. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near. A a man blind or lame, or one who has a mutilated face, or a limb too long, or a man who has an injured foot, or an injured hand, or a hunchback, or a dwarf, or a man with a defect in his sight, or an itching disease, or scabs, or crushed testicles, no man of the offspring of Aaron, the priest who has a blemish, shall come near to offer the Lord's food offerings. Since he has a blemish, he shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. Deuteronomy 23, 1 and 2. No one who has testicles who are crushed or those whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. No one born of a forbidden union may enter the assembly of the Lord even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord. And then Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And to the New Testament, Galatians 5, 7 through 15. Paul writes to the Galatian believers, you are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Now, I wish those who unsemble you would emasculate themselves. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So far, God's written word. We pray, O God, for an understanding of your word, that we should know you, not only who you are, but how you exercise your will in the world. May we therefore see that it is to sinners the gospel of grace through Jesus Christ is being offered, and the church must never corrupt this word. And may we be thankful for grace alone, because of the work of Christ alone, being our hope. Because therefore we are assured everything has been done perfectly, and we can now live free, your children, knowing that we shall see your face and dwell in glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Doctrine and precision definitely are 
getting a bad rap nowadays. People are unhappy with some of the controversies and the difficulties that we run into, and in fact, particularly, confessional churches and reformed churches are condemned for being divisive, being sticklers for really useless details, which while, again, it may be true, who cares? Because after all, there's somehow this greater principle of love that trumps everything. Well, true, obviously we could work off great principles that would be ideal. However, we are unglorified. Our thoughts are not perfect, and therefore the reason there is so much minutia in Revelation and so much precision is so that we would actually understand truth, so that we would know what is right. You know, you can't simply say, you know what, I wish I had a nice car. Okay, that's a wonderful wish. But if I have the money to give you this nice car, I don't know what you think is a nice car. You want a two-seat sportster? Do you want a pickup truck? Are you interested in luxury? I don't know. So you would need to tell me more of what you mean about nice so that I would have an understanding of what would be pleasing to you. So when God reveals his mind, when he gives us his word, it's not useless. It's not minutia. It's not unnecessary legalism. It's good because then we understand reality. What happens if you haven't wrestled with reality adequately? But we actually have two examples, uh, three examples in one prophecy. Example number one is Isaiah. He's a prophet of God, but God is about to call him to a mission and he raises Isaiah up and Isaiah is given a vision of the throne room of God and what is his response? It doesn't say it exactly this way, but the, the, the wording we have is, I am undone. A better image of this would be a person screaming in a mind-numbing terror, I'm going to die. That's what's happening. When even a prophet of God who has studied the word actually sees the unveiled glory of God, he knows instantly, I, I can't be here. I, I deserve to be dead, and in fact, I feel like I'm dying inside. Another example is Peter. He and his uh, brother and friends are fishing and Jesus says, you know, hey, throw the net there. And as soon as they pull in the fish, even that, the veiled glory of God, but revealing knowledge and power, Peter's response is, depart from me. I cannot be around you. You are too holy. And of course, most relevant for us today is Paul. As he is breathing murder, trying to go out and kill Christians, the minute he sees Jesus, his whole life is transformed. So knowing who God is matters. And the more we study it, the less shocking it will be. And the prophecy going forward is every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So let's know who is this Lord so that we do not have that mind-numbing terror of being undone, but rather we will rejoice that we also have the Lord's grace and we rest in it. So why all this background? Because the Apostle Paul is writing an incredibly harsh letter to Galatian Christians, to our sisters and brothers. And if I ever spoke to you in the way that Paul is speaking, you would be horrified, very angry with me, even if it was necessary. And Paul is a human being. He knows how to interact with people. It's not like this was his personality just going out there and attacking people. He knows this is going to be difficult for them to read. He knows he's going to offend many. So why does Paul consider it so necessary to speak so harshly, so brutally? Well, the same way a surgeon takes a knife and cuts off a leg that has gangrene and leaves you limp. He cuts off your leg. It's not because he doesn't like you. He knows that is what will save your life. So when Paul is speaking harshly, it's because it is necessary or they will die. And so now when God has preserved this word for you and me, yes, all that minutia, all that detail, all that nitpicky things are good. We need to hear it, however difficult it may be. And Paul rejoices in the Galatians, at least in remembering who they were. Notice he says, you were running well. You had heard and believed the truth that I brought to you. I, who used to be a Pharisaical legalist, had preached to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and how you, by faith, are saved. 
and you believed and you ran well. So who hindered you? How did this persuasion, this lie enter your midst? Because it's not from God. Well, that's where you see Genesis 3. Obviously, if one is deceiving them, it is the serpent who deceived the first man and the first woman, who took what was good. God had given to man the trees to produce fruit for them to eat. And the serpent came and said, but why not that tree too? Sure, the tens of millions of trees and the variety of all this produce is wonderful. And if you walked a few hundred steps that way, you would never even remember this tree exists. But let's focus on the fact that God wants to remain God God wants you to know you're a creature, and so he says, you can't have this. And at first, it looks like you get a proper response from Eve. It's like, yeah, God actually did give us this abundance. So she acknowledges that, and then she becomes a legalist. But God says not only don't eat, don't touch the tree. Okay, bad mistake. Don't help God out. Because what happens then is now that you've gone from don't eat, where God says, no, I'm sovereignly as your Lord, tell you don't do this, and now it goes to don't touch. Well, now, of course, you put more temptation, and now the serpent can touch it and say, hey, I thought God said you would die if you touched it. Here, I'm touching it. Nothing happened. And so now, because you've misinterpreted the law, you've added to the law, now all of a sudden when the law is challenged, you see it's not as strong or whatever, you start doubting God. And so... She lost the proper persuasion and started falling for the lie of the serpent. And the serpent kept pushing and saying, and you'll be better because of this. Like right now, if you guys keep on listening to this minister or any minister and then subscribing to the confession with all its limitations, you're a slave. You're not being allowed to intellectually develop. So be free, come up with new ideas. You can know good and evil. You can determine what is right. And that was so tempting to Adam and Eve. Adam, who was even a priest of God, but it brought them death. They were separated from God. For us to understand how important it is to honor God and his holiness, God, when he rescues the Israelites from Egyptian slavery, tells them rather, them, rather odd rule. For seven days, don't have any yeast, don't have any leaven in your house. All the bread you eat must be absolutely without yeast. Ritual, legalistic, kind of an annoying law. But there was a reason for it. He wanted them to understand that as his people, they had to forsake the whole world. They could not bring any of Egypt in their hearts with them. They were not allowed to look to Padan Aram and other places to bring any of the pagan gods. And when they entered Canaan, they had to purge it because otherwise that little bit of yeast would leaven the whole lump of dough, which was Israel, and corrupt it. We are not strong enough to fight temptation. We are not glorified, and therefore we must obey God and we must purge these things. So the law to the Israelites, which every year for seven days, they had to sweep out their house and make sure there would be no yeast in the house because it would corrupt. And we see this applied now to the Galatians because he says, now that you've allowed this little bit of persuasion to come in you, lest these false teachers speak, it's corrupting your whole church. It's going to cause the whole of you to be destroyed. And then Paul says something, again, sounds very harsh. Verse 12, I wish these guys would emasculate themselves, make themselves eunuch. Why would he say that? That's, I mean, you certainly would not like to be listening to me in a debate and either me saying that to my opponent or my opponent saying that to me. But see, Paul is not here lashing out as an angry man. What he's doing is he's considering the laws of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So, all right, you guys want to be legalists? You guys want to go back to the Pharisaical law? Don't delude yourselves. You keep thinking it's all about external moral actions and that that will be enough for you to appeal to God, to buy from God his favor. No, no, no. The law of God definitely had moral components that revealed how we are to act. But you see, the law of God also informed you. Any defect, any deficiency of your physical body would separate you from God. The law in the Israelite economy 
was given as a shadow of reality to show you how far you had fallen away. Do you have a limp? You're not allowed in the presence of God. Do you have a skin disease? You're not allowed in the presence of God. Your eyesight is going away, you have cataracts, God doesn't want you. And if you are emasculated, whether through accident, birth, or by deliberate surgery, if there's any deficiency in you as a man, God will not receive your sacrifice. So, to the legalists and those listening to the legalists in Galatia, Paul is telling them, let them hear the whole law. Get one nick or cut that makes you physically imperfect and your legalism doesn't make you more acceptable to God because you're trying harder than these people who are in the grace alone camp. It completely separates you from God. Do you not listen to the law? Listen to it now. Don't even let a little bit of leaven and legalism enter your church. So Aaron, please know none of your offspring, even though they're from the right genetic line, from the right family, have come to the right age, they will not be allowed even if they have a hunch in their back or an injured hand or any other deficiency. And then in Deuteronomy 23 too, even to the 10th generation, now, it's not a direct reference there to the physical, but it speaks of forbidden union. So a Levite with any other tribe or whatever, doesn't matter. 400 years later, I still don't want their descendants in my presence. So you want to deal with God by law, by works, by precision, by legalism? Understand, it won't take you long until a single defect permanently separates you from the house of God. And Paul, the reason he's so angry he saw the glory and majesty of Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he was blinded by it. He's aware of Peter's mind-numbing terror when Jesus just told him, catch fish on this side of the boat instead of this side. He knew how Isaiah felt that every molecule of his body had just vaporized or spread away because as he saw the holiness of God, he knew he could not be anywhere near him. And now Paul, as a minister of the gospel to the Galatians, says, if you go before this holy God, trying to impress him with your goodness, you will die. I had that self-righteousness, and I know I was better than you. I, I mean, I'm obsessive. I did everything. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And you know what? All Jesus had to say was, hey, Paul, and that was it. I was blinded. I'm sparing you that. That's why the Reformed are confessional. That's why we preach with so much precision, because we know what happens when people are deluded and try to impress God with their righteousness. But now, we live in the age when the servant of the Lord of Isaiah 61 has come. And God himself, who is this holy and perfect God, who gave all the temple economy, all the Mosaic law, also willed that there would come the time when one would have his spirit, his redeemer. And what would he do? He would bring good news to the outcasts, the poor. Earlier in Isaiah, which I'd put that in there, remember when John the baptizer wanted to know as he is rotting in prison, Jesus, weren't you the Messiah? And what did Jesus say? Hey, go back and tell John that the lame are able to walk, the blind are able to see, the lepers are cleansed, all part of the Isaiah prophecies. And so here again, God comes to take those who were defective, unfit to be in the physical temple, and actually make them the spiritual temple. He is the one who comes and tells us, Yes, all your sins are atoned for. All your deficiencies are canceled. And so in Isaiah 54, you even have that prophecy. Or 57, the eunuchs will actually be a pillar in the temple of God. So here is the sphere of the Lord God anointing me, Christing, messiahing me to bring good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to the captives, opening the prison to those who are bound, the Lord, year of the Lord's favor. Jubilee, the cancellation of all debt. You're no longer poor. You're no longer an outcast. You have your original inheritance. Comforting all who mourn. Making sure that you are given a headdress of joy. 
so that you will be known as God's tree, planted by the waterside, and he will receive the glory. But against his enemies, vengeance. Those who would go before God and demand their rights and recognition of their works, there will be only death and judgment. But those who know that they are poor and sorrowful, who know that they have a crushing debt they cannot pay, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is jubilee, payment of all debt. It is healing. It is resurrection from the dead. And that's why Paul is horrified that these people are being taught any form of fair sake legalism, even though the laws they are quoting are actually from God. They were meant to show you how far you were separated from God, not to try to make you better. But then he goes on to say, one, I hope that these people have the full weight of the law on them and are emasculated. But then he goes on and says, look, you are called to this freedom a freedom more amazing than you can imagine. And this is how you know you've rightly understood the gospel. If you explain the gospel correctly, the person hearing it is going to say, oh, so you're telling people they can sin as much as they want. If you get that reaction, you've explained it correctly because that's exactly what happens when Paul explains it in Romans because after he's done, he's, he assumes the person's going to ask, so shall I continue sinning so that grace may abound? Okay, good, you've understood grace. But you're called to a whole new life. So you're not only saved, you are made a new creation. And so he goes on to say in verse 13, you are called to freedom, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge the flesh. But instead, with the same love that saved you, that same spirit that was in Christ is now given to you, serve one another. Because... The law is not fulfilled by keeping all the minutia that these pharisaical uh, believers are telling you. Rather, the law is fulfilled in this one command. Love your neighbor as much as it you love yourself. If instead you become a legalist, understand there has never been a moralist or legalist that is gracious to his opponents. You cannot be. Because if you impose on yourself a moralistic, legalistic mindset, that means you have to judge everybody else by those things. And anybody who is not trying as hard as you, you know is filthy, polluted, worthless. I mean, you may want well for them, but you know no good's going to come to them. And if someone's doing better than you, you're angry at them because you have poured yourself into it and they're still doing better. He says, don't you understand? Love one another. But if you decide to be a Pharisee, you will bite and devour one another and be consumed by one another. You will destroy yourselves. So why do we care so much about the gospel of grace? Why do we spend so much time talking about grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, all the while rejecting any form of law works righteousness to impress God and then turning right around and demanding everybody consider the law and seek to do good and love because we want to rightly understand the full counsel of God. He wants us to know our situation, our condition is because he is gracious. He has forgiven us our sins. He also wants us to know our calling. We are called to be more and more Christ-like. Not that he will love us, but because he's put his spirit into us. And now we are to love one another and thereby demonstrate the will of God is being fulfilled. So we have to be at the same time meticulous, rigorous, seeking to understand truth, not allowing error to enter. And then at the same time, expressing a level of graciousness and openness and willingness that might make people wonder if we even have a conscious thought as we let everybody come in, as we welcome everyone into the kingdom, as we seek to see that good is done to everybody. Yeah, that is the mind of Christ, to know God, love him so absolutely that even if it, we are told, go to the cross and die, Jesus says, not my will but yours be done. And in the midst of a people 
hating God so much, blaspheming him, because keep in mind, crucifying Jesus is hating God enough to want to kill him, the ultimate form of blasphemy. Yet at the same time, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. And then when he's resurrected, he doesn't come as the avenger, but rather tells the ladies, tell my brothers, they're going to meet me, and he gives them the commission, go and preach the good news and call people from every tribe and tongue and nation to be my inheritance, my nation whom I will bless. And so Paul, having been given the Spirit, having understood these things, cannot abide by the false teaching, the leaven of the serpent entering the church, even by supposedly well-meaning people who have high regard for the law. He says, no, have proper regard for the law. Know that the law cannot make man righteous because man is unglorified. No deficiency of the law. Huge deficiency with the man hearing it. Therefore, the man of this age needs the gospel. The word that the law has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ, where he let every jot and tittle condemn him, and he still did righteously, died the sinner's death, and now gives you all his righteousness, makes you his own. And now that you know this is your jubilee, your freedom prophesied in the law, understand that you are now called to love. Turn this freedom into a free opportunity to look outward rather than worrying about whether or not you've tithed your mint and your cumin and your dill. Not worrying, like, look at what the needs are out there and love your sister and your brother and serve them rather than being so consumed and obsessed with your own self-righteousness. And then instead of consuming one another, we'll be building up one another. And when we build up one another, we're actually building up the body of Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here who does not want to see Christ more glorious? Now, of course, we can't make him more glorious, but we can make the church his body to be shown to be a beautiful entity, a beautiful gift to the world, a light that will draw many to Christ. Let's pray. Our great God and Father, we thank you this day for the wonders of the freedom announced to us in the gospel. And we pray that we would actually begin to understand what it means that we are truly free in the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet the world is just because the debt has been paid. And so, instead of self-righteously pursuing minutia and demanding rigor from others and hating everybody for failing or being better than us, let us instead delight in the Lord Jesus Christ and love our sisters and brothers because he loved them and saved them. And let us recognize the wonderful gift we are to one another, called as one body to build up one another. And so, Lord, we know our weakness. You've revealed it. But we know your majesty, your love, your gracious work. Help us, therefore, to be even more confident of the work you mean to accomplish through us. So let us trust you and worship you and serve you and let that service be demonstrated to everyone because we love one another. So we thank you for this word of life. Amen. And so, beloved, let us acknowledge that we are no longer our own, but we belong to Jesus Christ. And now, therefore, even our very lives are in the hands of God. And he did not call us to be rigorous, self-righteous, moralists, but rather those who lovingly serve him and one another. So let us stand and sing, take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Swift and beautiful for thee. Take 
take my voice and let me sing always only for my king take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee filled with messages from thee take my silver and my gold not a might would i withhold take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose every power as thou shalt choose take my will and make it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure. Store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. Please be seated. Well, as we come to the table of the Lord, then we understand this is not us declaring to the world, hey, look at me, see, I've decided to be a Christian. It is rather a testimony from God. I have called you to a new life and you need the spiritual nourishment for that life. And you've heard the word, but again, you're still creatures of this age. You have limitations. And so I'm gonna engage every one of your senses and testify, I really am with you. You don't need to worry about obtaining my love through your self-righteousness, nor do you need to doubt whether I love you here. The one who died for you, here is his flesh and his blood. And so in the Lord's Supper, God is giving us the means of grace, not materially, but testifying through them as a sealing sign here. No, surely the sacrifice for your sins has already been accomplished. Your debt is already canceled. And the spirit that you need in order that you would actually love the people I've gathered here, well, here it is, the spirit of Christ is given to you. And so, beloved, the Lord's Supper is indeed a testimony of a reality that we have received, and it is meant to strengthen our faith in order that we would indeed, in love, serve one another in the freedom we have been given, and all this because it brings glory to God, our God and Father. So, the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread blessed it, then broke it, and declared and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper also, declaring, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, because as often as you are eating this bread and drinking this cup rightly, you are giving profession to the reality of the work of Christ and proclaiming his death on the cross until his second coming. But also, if you should approach this as a self-righteous one who appreciates the assistance that Jesus is giving, but he is not actually your whole life and righteousness, you'll be eating and drinking the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner and thereby guilty of profaning, blaspheming the body and the blood of the Lord. So those who are unwilling, unprepared to hear what God has to say, his full counsel, the law, and the gospel, then understand this supper will bring you only further condemnation. But if you're worried, if you recognize that you are an unrighteous man or woman, that you don't have the righteousness of the law, you are exactly the right person being invited to this table. Because you're not coming believing yourself to be worthy, I read the law, I did my best, I'm good enough. You're coming because you know Christ is perfectly worthy. And you are coming in order to have your faith strengthened 
by Christ's Spirit, feeding us and nourishing us with his body and blood. And so, beloved, be assured, the word of God has promised to us the favor of God according to his eternal covenantal promises that he cannot ever fail to keep. And so, he now adds this confirmation to you and me in our weakness. Come, believing sinners, taste and see. The Lord is good. Let's pray. Our almighty God, we come before you because the blood of the only begotten Son of God has granted to us access to the very throne room of God. And though at this time we will obtain the mystery of the bread and the wine, the Lord's Supper, yet we know the reality that it, to which it testifies is more certain and more firm than this creation and cannot be shaken. And so we come before you by your command, through your promise, by the work of your spirit, and we are united to God through Christ, the God-man, our great high priest, your son. And so we pray that we will receive the promised gift, strengthen that we may go forth and bear the fruits of righteousness in love, believing and worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Beloved, that you and I may now be nourished with Christ, who is the true bread from heaven. Let us lift up our hearts to Christ Jesus, our advocate, who is seated at the right hand of his heavenly Father. And let's firmly believe every promise that he has made. And let us have no doubts about the promise that we will be nourished and refreshed as we receive his body and blood by the working of the Holy Spirit, as surely as you will receive bread and wine in remembrance of him. So, beloved, lift up your spirits and hearts on high. We lift them up to the Lord. As the elders dismiss you, please come forward, receive the elements, and we will partake together. Shout for joy, O barren one. You who born no child, break forth into joyful singing sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman. So enlarge the place of the tent, stretch out the curtains of the dwellings, don't spare, lengthen the cords. You will spread abroad to the right and to the left and your descendants will possess the nations and resettle the desolate cities. Everyone who thirsts come to the waters, even if you have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why would you spend your money on what's not bread and your wages on what will not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good and delight in abundance by the covenants made by God. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. By his scourgings we are healed. And the Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain. Banquet of aged wine, choice pieces of marrow, refined aged wine. And he will swallow the covering that is over all the peoples, the veil that is stretched over the nations. He will swallow up death for all time. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, removing the shame of his people from all the earth. And on that day we will say, this is our God on whom we waited that he might save us. This is the Lord on whom we have waited. So let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. But he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink.
The Apostle Paul was writing to a church that people who were beginning to be led astray, who were doubting the truth, some who had even begun to embrace lies. Jesus gave his word and the supper to his disciples whom he knew were going to betray him. And so you're not being given the supper right now because you've proven yourself worthy. You are being given the supper because God knows your weakness. He knows our need to be strengthened. And he is testifying and telling us, listen to me, not to the serpent and his ministers and liars. Listen to me and believe me. I will be your righteousness and give you everything. So on the night that Jesus was going to be taken to the cross, he broke the bread on the side of his disciples and declared, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, remember, and believe. Christ's body, his sacrifice, all sufficient to make you right with God forevermore. And Jesus took the cup of blessing and declared, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, blood shed for you, in order to establish not a covenant of works, but this covenant where you will graciously receive the promised inheritance. Take, drink, remember, and believe the blood of Christ, which unites you forevermore to God and makes you to be heirs of all the promises. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we acknowledge the great mystery of this holy feast. And although we are unworthy, naturally, to share this meal with you, yet we come because you invited us, you dressed us in Christ's righteousness, and you have brought us into the Holy of Holies and we have entered without fear. We have received pardon for our sins and we see our great high priest seated on his throne, mediating for us, declaring that we are reconciled to you. So now, please strengthen us by these gifts so that we will learn to rely only on your promise to save sinners to whom you have given your spirit, regenerated, who now call on your name, so that we may by your spirit also honor you with our souls and our bodies and bring honor and glory to your holy name in all the earth. Amen. Beloved, we give our offerings then not to impress God, not to buy our way into God's favor, but rather as a privileged response of love that the gospel would go forth in all the earth. And so please never ever give it thinking, you know what, I may not be acting good, but you know, I give so much money, God has to love me. He made the heavens and the earth. He needs nothing from us. Rather, it is our privilege to be able to participate in this great work of ministry. Collection plate is available as you exit. Beloved, let us stand and sing praise to the Holy Trinity. Let us stand and sing the words uh, to the tune of Come Thou Almighty King. To the great one in three, eternal praise. Sovereign majesty, may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. The benediction is given not to saints, not to those who are glorified. It is given to you and me, and it is a firm declaration of the intent and will of God to make us glorious and beautiful in his sight. So, beloved, now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, now equip you in everything good that you may do his will and love your neighbor as yourself, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom will be the glory forever and evermore, and to you, grace forever and evermore. Amen.